know what to expect here. If you've never heard of Dell before, I have no idea what you're thinking, but it's not going to be what you think. Uh, we're lucky enough to have with us, oh, I'm Howard Johnson, by the way. I wrote Dell's biography, the funniest one in the room. And uh, I was a longtime friend of Dell, student of Dell, then Sharda at the beginning of the Improv Olympic, which is now the I.O. And to my left, Sharda Halpern, the, the ground Parker, and I think we have to hold him responsible for cleaning him up, Sharon. Yeah, he gave me a good time, too. Yeah. <laughs> and then to her left, Ed Greenberg, from the, we have three guests in the room. Ed Greenberg, Jim Crana, and Chris Gray. Yeah, we are, uh, we're here to talk about Dell's Dell's life in San Francisco with the committee, San Francisco and LA, and there's there's a lot to talk about, and I uh, I, I think we have a little bit of and we're going to go off, and I want to remind anybody in the audience, if you knew Dell, if you've got a question, if you've got a story, if we can see you, uh, let us know, and we'll be happy to let you interrupt us to your heart's content at this point. Yes, closest interrupt us. Uh, we are, uh, we're talking about Del Close. Del who was, uh, he was a fire eater. He was, uh, well, uh, boy, how do you describe Del? Let's, let's start out that way. How would each of you describe Del? He was a mad scientist. Mad scientist, definitely. Uh, Del was, uh, Probably, you know, probably the smartest person I ever met in my life, and uh, a true iconoclast, and a, a, a uh, unbelievable, wonderful, uh, complex, funny sen sense of humor. An incredible teacher, also scary. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I hate to take it in another direction for a moment. Okay. You know, my first memory of Dell, I was from Portland, Oregon. I moved to San Francisco. I saw the committee. I went in. I took a workshop. They hired me to be in it. And I remember half the time I saw Dell, he had just shot up. And I had never seen anybody function as brilliantly as he did with what he did to himself. I mean, I used to drink and smoke weed and smoke cocaine, but Dell was one, I mean, I've never seen a, a, he had the hardest body of anyone I've ever seen. I bumped into him once on stage and fell backward about three feet. He was just all muscle. And on stage with him was always a delight because I've worked with Chris, I've worked with Ed, and you can sort of, with them, you can sort of figure out if I say this, Ed will probably say that, and I can say this, and then Chris will say that. With Dell, you never knew what was coming out of his mouth. And generally, it was all good. It was wonderful. I mean, he was, the word brilliant is tossed around a lot, but he was. He was just, he knew more about things than anybody I know. And he was able to do more things than anybody I ever met in improv. It was, and he was harder than a rock, which I never understood. He was like, just, I mean, he was like in great physical shape. And he was also insane and a wonderful human being. Um, I met him when, when he first came to the committee. I was in a theater at the time called The Pitchel Players. And, um, and he would give us workshops. And we would go watch. And he got kind of interested in us. And so we spent a lot of time with him. And, um, and everyone has said how mad and, and uh, brilliant he was. So let's get into how mad was he. Um, well, there's the famous, uh, there's a number of the famous stories that the, the, the rehearsal that the committee took it. When he came through the stage during a rehearsal, through the, like this one, axed his way up through it, started screaming on, oh my god, I'm on top of a, a Chinese cemetery, a Chinese cemetery, it was actually a mortuary. But he was just crazy about it. But to have somebody come through your stage while you're working is like um, something you sort of never forget. And, and he was constantly doing things uh, of that nature. Uh, and uh, nutty. I, I, 
was at one point he passed the torch of satire to the uh, picture players because he felt that nothing could be satirized anymore. And we were way off in the political satire. And so he passed us the uh, torch. And uh, he lit that torch, did all this stuff, and then he handed it to us, knowing that there was no fire in his room. But there was this one guy who now is a very famous Tai Chi master who was in our group. And he uh, just grabbed it and went <laughs> and did, did the whole thing. And afterwards, I asked him, Alex Hing, I said, I don't know you need fire. He said, I never did. It was the first time I ever did it. But they would put you in positions where you had to you had to think really quick. You had to do something very definite. And if you did a scene that interested him, one night uh, I was in a scene at the Pitchels that was about two kids learning how to swear. And it was, very, it was uh, before people were swearing a lot, and so it was kind of very funny. And uh, but it was tasteful. So he went back to the <laughs> committee and gave them three hours notes on that scene, which uh, I heard a great deal about for the, about the next week, about how everybody had to stay till 2 in the fucking morning to listen to, to notes about something they had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> My favorite memory of Bill, we used to play theater games. And one of the things we used to do at the committee was you would have to stand up, it had two levels. You had to stand up on the one level, and everybody, like the other eight people, would, would stand like this before you. And you would have to put your arms up and just fall into their arms. And that was a big thing for a lot of us. I hated it. But I did it, you know, and it's just, and they did trust it. Trust exercise. Trust exercises. <laughs> and Dell gave a workshop once that I think was predominantly women. And so he was going to show them this. And Dell was incredibly heavy body. He was thick. And so he got up on the thing, and he had like these eight women. And they all stood like that. Dell put his arms up and fell through their arms, and they had no hope. He just crashed to the floor, separated his shoulder, horrified the women, you know. And he said, no, it's all right. It's okay. And he went back up and did it again. <laughs> and at that point, I realized this was not a normal human. I mean, this was, no, this was a guy who had visions of things that I had no understanding of. Yeah. Uh, I hear so many stories about, and these are all great stories about Dell and, you know, things he did when he was high and his substance abuse and what a genius he was. But it's, it's very important, I believe, to, to really emphasize that Dell um, was a, a theater visionary. And his early experiments with long form at the committee and what that has turned into and where it continues to go is Dell knew um, when the, I was in this experiment that worked really well. We had been playing around with this thing for a while and it worked so well that Dell was running around smoking three cigarettes at once or whatever, saying, uh, and it was this long form piece. We need a name for this because we're creating theater history here. So Bill Matthew, the piano player, said, because Dell was bouncing off the walls, Harold's a nice name. And that's how it came. But what's important about that is, other than that little historical factoid, is that Dell said, we are creating theater history here. And he meant it. And he was right. And that sense of the big picture and his belief in improvisational theater and famously fought with Bernie Sons, who owned Second City at that time, about whether improv was just a technique towards something, you know, whether it could be standalone as a theater form. Dell truly to his core believed that as an artist and pursued that and with Sharna and it, and, it can, and you guys are all here because of Dell's artistic vision. Uh, I want to point out, uh, we, we did the first Herald ever at the, was it ballet? It was up here. It was in San Francisco. And we did a Herald. And Del just said, 
Uh, the first act is all these scenes, and then after that, you're just going to take a suggestion and go for half an hour. And we did it, and it seemed to work. And he said, what should we call it? And I think Billy Matthew, the piano player, said Herald. And he meant H-E-R-A-L-D, an announcement of new thing. And we heard Harold, H-A-R-O-L-D, a, a person's name. And to this day, it's spelled H-A-R-O-L-D. It's, a, you know, it's somebody's name, it's not the beginning of a brand new piece of theater. We will argue, I just realized, until the end of time, <laughs> about the name Harold. Because yeah. to me, it was Bill saying Harold as if you could have just as easily said to counterpoint Dell's enthusiasm, Irving is a nice name, and it might have been called Irving, but... Well, I remember when Dell told me it was Irving. <laughs> 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 so, well, he said that uh, it was kind of like a snide comment, like when they asked the Beatles, what's yeah. your haircut's name, and they said, oh, what do you call that haircut? They said, Arthur. Yes. Just, that's, that's what's like, Bill what do you call it? Right? Yeah, that was Bill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was Dell's yeah. interpretation of it. It was, like, what what yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Harold. And he said, like, how would Einstein feel if you know, the theory of relativity was called Harold, you know? But uh, because Del says yes, he said yes and agreed, and it became Harold. And a few days later, there was this, Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention came out with an album, and on the album was a song called the brown shoes don't make it. And Dale came rushing into the theater and said, you've got to listen to Brown Shoes Don't Make It by Frank Zappa. It's a musical Herald. Mm -hmm. I thought you said, oh, the Heralds, when they were first, first came about, the Pigeons got involved in it because to, to, to rehearse this form that um, Alan and Joe Matthew had come up with, this is before Dell got out there, they wanted to create jazz through improvisation, sort of acting, keeping the things that improvisation has, but they wanted to flow and to have the soul of uh, jazz. And so they used our theater on, uh, they used us, we just be guinea pigs, and they try out stuff until they finally got enough out of us. Uh, and then they took it back to the, the to pay rehearsals. <laughs> and, uh, I, I just remember uh, the heralds don't always have. I mean, Dell in this case is this, this one famous improvisational actor who really blames Dell for killing uh, satire in improvisation because he told the his, the herald people don't read the newspaper, and that was like the backbone of the committee at that time. So then it became kind of fractured, and, and so that's the only negative thing I'm going to say about him in that in that sense. Well, that is hygiene. It's hiking, <laughs> that's on, that's a kind of, they, they did a record, he did a record with the John Brent uh, at one point when they were both in Second City called uh, How to Speak Him. Yeah. Yes. And in it, if you can see one, and they, you can often find these in the, you know, places. It's on CD now. Huh? Oh, it? Oh, okay. yes. Oh, oh final record says. Really? It's and two it's, lunatics at the height of their power. And this is the, the uh, manual that's in it, which makes the five one look that because that's the thing that's rare. And, now, uh, they, were, and they were hipsters. They weren't beatniks. That's very important. Yeah. They were hipsters. And so they did have a spiritual background in what they were doing. Uh, they really, you know, they, they, when they took acid, they were actually looking to talk to God as opposed to just going we. And, uh, and it was still legal then. And um, I just, uh, and Grady Grady was called King Romney. Well, let's, let's, I don't know, I'm just my to, so much stuff to take a step back and just put everything into context, I'll just give you a little bit of Dell's background. He, uh, he left high school in Manhattan, Kansas, to go traveling with Dr. Dracula and his Tomb of Terror, where he would run through the audience at a particular moment in Bride of Frankenstein and throw handfuls of wet cooked spaghetti in the crowd, screaming, screaming a play the worms shall descend upon you. So that was his introduction to show business. Uh, Dell went on to join the Barter Theater, where he did a lot of regular, well, classic theater, Barter Theater, West Virginia. And then he became involved with the Compass Players, uh, the St. Louis Compass Players, as opposed to the Chicago Compass Players, the original 
And there he worked with Mike Nichols and Elaine May and Nancy Ponder and Ben Flicker and Sever Darden and, and whatnot. And after that, it was after that, and after Dell, I think he did How to Speak Hip prior to that, because he did stand up yeah. comedy as well. They did, they, he told me he was, they just did it, they knocked it off, they were in Canada, he and Dell, they were broke. And someone said, well, I'll pay you $200 to cut it, to improvise an album on how to talk hip. And they said, sure. And they went into the studio for an hour and a half, and this is what came out. They got their money, and they went back to the United States. But if you're inside the, the thing, where is it? There, there was a card, you know, saying that you knew how you were hip. And, uh, and it was a big thing to be hip in those days. John Brent was the hipster. You know, everybody, you know, when Bob Dylan came to town, he was, John Brent always stayed with him, and they always hung out and did all that kind of stuff because they knew each other from the village and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's a different, it's a, it's a much, I, what I call a better, uh, Understanding of what you know of of the soul of things, and they and they were truth seekers, as opposed to just the funny. Funny was okay, but they, they liked to have something that said something because that kept them interested. Because they were just pools of of creativity and things that they wanted to have said. And so that's the great thing that, that improvisation has going for it. Well, why don't we take a, a quick break here? At, well, not take a break, but we're uh, could we? Watch, we've got several clips here in store from Alan Myers, the original director of the committee, and Carl Gottlieb. And <laughs> the, the chronology is a little, it's a tiny bit off, but uh, Carl mostly got it right. When Dell was working with the St. Louis Company, the St. Louis Compass players, uh, that was when they, separate of Iola's Poland, developed their own set of rules for improvisation. It was largely Elaine May and Ted Flicker. After a performance, they would sit down and they would go over everything and figure out what worked and what didn't work. And then Dell and the others were their guinea pigs the next day at rehearsal. Uh, they would run it and then that night they would perform. And so slowly but surely they developed what they call the Westminster Place Kitchen Rules. Uh, and those were really the rules for improvisation for performance as opposed to the improvisational rules for games as Viola Spolin developed them. Uh, so one reason why Dell was such an important thing to use. After the uh, West, after the St. Louis Compass, Dell went on to Second City and he worked, he was with the second cast at Second City. He wasn't there at the very beginning. But uh, Dell went on and worked with, worked with Spolin there and Paul Sills and Bernie Sollins and Howard Alt, you know, the of Second City there. And uh, eventually, Dell was directed by Alan Myers in one of the shows. And Dell always claims that Alan fired him. Uh, Alan kind of disputes that, but I don't, I don't know what the real fact is exactly. But uh, after Dell was fired, he ended up out in LA where he was working on Get Smart and My Mother the Car and doing a lot of sit-down work. And then he was having some tough times. So he called Alan, who was up in San Francisco here, and uh, Alan had recently, well, about a year or so before that, had developed the committee. And he said, well, you know, I know you fired me, Alan, or, but, uh, you know, what do you think? I'd like to come back. And Alan said, great, come back and be our director. And so Dell moved Lock, Stock, and Barrel up to become a director of the committee. Is that pretty much as you remember it? And he acted for a couple of weeks before. Well, he would act on and off. Yeah, okay. Dell, Dell liked acting. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Del like I mean, he did movie and TV shows and stuff. But. Well, that's, we've got a clip from Alan, number two, I think it is. Jamie, if you could get that up. This is Alan Meyerson, the original director and founder of the committee, talking about Del as an actor. <laughs> so, uh, you, you got to remember to put it in context that at this time, there was no long form improvisation. I mean, it really didn't exist. It didn't exist until the committee put their heads together and started coming up with something. That took a couple of years. Yeah. It was 67 or 68, as I remember. The way Alan 60, told me. Yeah, 67. Well, the way Alan told me, there were three of them. Alan was teaching a class at San Francisco State. Uh, Bill Matthew was doing a musical workshop. And Dell was directing a workshop of his own. And they were all working toward this same goal, this holy grail, which, which it was at the time, called you know, long-form improvisation, for example. And one day they sat down 
come together and they just kind of pieced it all together and realized they were working toward the same thing and that's how the arrow really got got going. Let me uh, let me just uh, clear it up. Long, but no. <laughs> hey, Bill Matthews said, we'll call it Harold. That's the story. But anyway. I have a question. Yes. But this is the Sitting up here, but really, I should be over there because um, Dell started working with me in the '80s, and at that time, we were I, the only thing that was going on was short games, and and I actually approached Dell. There's a whole long story with that, but I'm going to just be short about it. That I thought there was something more for improvisation. And he said, "Well, I've been working on something since the '60s called the committee, with the committee." Uh, called long form improvisation, which is I have a structure called Harold that's basically unteachable and unplayable. But if we work together and take some of your games, we could probably create something. And then he and I sat down and came up with time dashes and all these different forms. So my question is, what was the structure of the Harold back then? Because I know you didn't have the structure we have now. Well, here, here's here. There essentially wasn't one, and it was really in short. Now I got I, I got to give you credit because. Because Dell, Del, Dell's genius was in his uh, in his right brain approach to things, but it was inconsistent. And he told me that with the form you guys put together, it worked all the time. So well, that's the well, well yeah. <laughs> but, but that Dell, Dell, Jeff. Now it was all the time before. It didn't. But, I'm just telling yeah, you what he yeah, said. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. he said what what. What that brought to it was consistent with it. Consistent. Right, right. We could be, you know, brilliant sometimes and, yeah. and, and horrible other times. But but that up, the, better, up yeah. the what I want to come back to is uh, uh, setting aside the, the, the value of long form improvisation and Harold and how the name came about and all the rest is how did the name come about? <laughs> And uh, but he was a mess personally. In holes everywhere in his body. 
from shooting up. And he, you know, lived in a roach infested apartment in, across from Santa City. And they used to just give him a bottle of booze to go home so that he would complain about how they were treating him. So when he left Santa City and I started working with him, you know, I got him out of the roach infested apartment and taught him that, you know, you don't have to have roaches. You, can, you, don't, have to, you don't have to throw out your underwear. You can wash it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, he was just sitting on the edge of his bed with a wrench and turned his TV channel light like, out of the TV with a remote control. It was fun into the new world, you know. So I run a power line, a lot of extension cord from the neighbors upstairs. He's called borrowing a cup of electricity from his neighbors so he could have a TV plugged in. He couldn't have a, a light and the TV running at the same time because there was only one, uh, one outlet there. So I brought him into the real world, you know, but, um, and, and then he started to be able to, you know, like he didn't have a phone because he couldn't have a phone because the president was on TV and said something he didn't like. He'd call the president for his life and then he'd go to jail, so no phone. No, that was his logic. So, you know, I talked him into having a phone and that, you know, he could call me before he could call the president. So, so he eventually said, in fact, in fact um, once we ran into a friend uh, and he said, Dell, you look great. Close the he goes, oh, this is my partner, Sharon, we have a theater where we go to book, we're doing shows, and, you know, I live in this place. And they went, my God, Close, you've gone insane. <laughs> yeah, there's a pulse in a bunch of uh, stories about Dell which really aren't so artsy. They're just, uh, yeah, they're they're just they're, uh, idiosync, but they're crazy. True but weird. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to start off and everybody can go. Go. Just, uh, yeah, see. Uh, when they were playing in um, LA at the Tiffany Theater, uh, one night Dell and uh, the guy who had been the piano player for the Pitchels who told me this story, uh, Dell talked, they were still in the theater, and Dell talked them into going uh, into going up to the ceiling and breaking into Metro Media, which was right next to them. And Larry said, oh man, we're going to get in trouble. And Dell said, no, no, it's the ceiling. There's no burglar alarm up there. There's no problem. And of course, they went up, they opened the door, and there's a guy with a gun, and they were arrested immediately. And then they went away. And then Jim Brenna, this oh, oh. Well, a couple of things about Dell. No, about the, 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 the spider. The spider. Yeah. yeah. That we were well, okay, what happened when he got busted was that they took all his clothes off. And uh, he had so many tracks on his body. His whole body was covered with needle marks that they offered to let him go if he'd allow himself to be photographed for criminology books. Oh, yeah. wow. Which left the, uh, my friend a little high and dry. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I, I took Dell's apartment. He, he moved down to L.A. to, to uh, get the second committee going down there. And I took over. I, I was living in his apartment. And the first night, I laid down on the bed. And I looked up at the ceiling. And it was just covered with blood spat. Because, <coughs> well, I mean, it wasn't one. It was like hundreds. But he'd, he'd shoot up, and then he'd empty the needle into the ceiling. Or out somewhere. And just stop. You know, and, it was, and I looked up, and it, it looked... It looked like rust, and it just, and I kept thinking, what the hell is that? And then I finally asked somebody, and they said, who lived there? And I said, Dell. And they said, well, that's Dell. Well, you know, here's the thing. Dell is, uh, in addition to when we all described, Dell was uh, brilliant, he was hilarious, he was a wonderful guy, and also the most complicated person I've ever known. So. Yeah, there was all of that stuff, and sometimes it was, um, you know, you just, yeah, it was, Del had a real problem with substance abuse, but he uh, had a major impact on everything we do in the most positive way. So, you know, you well, take the crunchy. But he also stuff. overcame all that. I mean, he stopped shooting up, he stopped drinking, and um, when I was with him, he was pretty clean, except for some hot, maybe some mushrooms. The only drug he couldn't beat was cigarettes. And that's one that did it So what's the dangerous drug, I guess? Uh, I used to love watching Dell smoke. Okay, you made it look so good. Well, <laughs> excuse me for a minute. I do not advocate this at all. But Dell would smoke. Don't try this at all. Yeah, Dell would smoke like this. This is a lit cigarette. And he's sitting here like this, and he's doing this, and then he'll take a puff, and then he'll do this, and then he'll take a puff. And, you know, some of the times he puffed the wrong end. But it was just, it was 
the most amazing thing, because the cigarette became alive in his hands. It just, it was so much a part of it. It was just amazing. And it did the same thing when it hit his mouth. Yeah. It, it was travel around his mouth. And often I remember it being coming out of the corners of his mouth, yeah. sticking straight up like that. And his chin would be up, and he'd be pontificating about something. You know, um, he would do this trick where he would have the cigarette. It's from his fire eating days. He set my car on fire one time. <laughs> And, it was, and he would have the cigarette, and he'd be talking, and then he'd do this, and the cigarette would disappear into his throat or whatever. And, and then a minute later, out it would come with a lot of smoke, and he'd start smoking like nothing. Well, remember his 50th birthday party, instead of blowing out the candles, he would say, Joe, we just put them all in his mouth. <laughs>
he was out in the, in the house directing, and, and he let me walk off the stage with a blindfold on, and I just fell on the ground. You know, I dropped maybe three or four feet. It was a shock. It didn't <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I took my blindfold off, and I said, tell him, what the fuck, man? Why didn't you let me do it? He said, well, it's just too interesting. I was watching it. <laughs> <laughs> Even with that, and he set my car on fire trying to eat fire and showing off and, you know, the, too much, I don't know, he explained it as sometimes you get a little too much, uh, you know, 301 oil on the cotton and the uh, top of the car is like they had to pull over and put out the fire. Yeah, did you mess with that for a living? Fire yes, I was okay. about the incombustible person. Yes. Um, <laughs> but Dell was... Um, you know, I, I, my personal experience with Dale was that I had never, and he was so odd in conventional terms. Of course, all of San Francisco, Dale would say that he loved San Francisco because he said, we would sit in front of Enrico's and all of Dale's friends would walk by and he said, this is a great community. I feel really at home here because truly certifiable crazy people are functioning members of the community. We have any questions? Well, let me just tell one more story just because this kind of distracts us. When he was living in the Tiffany, I kept waiting for when you said it, he lived in the attic and what he slept on was a spider web which he had uh, constructed himself out of the nylon cord. Yes. And he slept on this, this spider web. So when people wanted to see him, they say, where's Dell? He said, it's upstairs. They'd yell Dell, and he'd say, I'm up here, and I'm up here, and I'm up here. And then there was a ladder to go, and then there was this huge spider web, and there was Dell living on it. <laughs> and I think that kind of says something. Well, Dell, Dell spidered every building he was ever in, I think. I didn't know that. Yeah, no, every place he went, he loved crawling on the interior spaces of buildings. And I don't know why, but he would do it. You know, we'd be in a new theater, and suddenly Dell was gone. And where's Dell? It's kind of like what he didn't mind. Yeah. yeah. Where's Dell? You know, and then we hear this rustling up over there in the wall, and he'd climb down and go, you know, they got a lot of pipes, and you know, it was. <laughs> he was amazing. That, that's how we find the Chinese cemetery. <laughs> how are we over time, Jeannie? Uh, we have time for a few questions. A few questions? Okay. Oh, we just want to talk. We'll keep talking. Yeah, we can just keep going. Um, one thing we haven't talked about that I wanted to squeeze in here before we go. Even if you haven't heard of Dell, you may have heard of the guy who bequeathed his skull for their productions of, for theatrical productions of Hamlet. Oh, oh that's a good one for you. For the good one theater. Yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was left to me. That was my big task after he died. So yeah. make it happen any way you can. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, I did. I, um, well, actually, what happened was really the truth of the matter finally came out in the New Yorker. But I, I had to, because Dell taught me not to bail on each other's ideas, you say yes to each other's ideas. And he wanted it to happen. And most of the places that I called said no. And, uh, <laughs> You know, I was, I still kept calling. I found even more. It was like, you can't get this body out of here. <laughs> so I uh, had them cremated, and I found this place where they sell skulls, skeletons to the anatomical society. And uh, waited a few months, because I read that it takes a while to prepare a skull. And then I had a big thing in the theater and presented the skull and to, to the Goodman, to Bob Walls. And it was an incredible event. And I got away with it for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> many, many years. Um, especially because I'm such a bad criminal and such a bad liar, but in the very beginning, when it was, after it was, after it happened, I got a call, you know, the press was always saying, who did it, who was the one who did it, who, and I could say, I promise I would tell, because it's a pathologist who get fired, so I can't tell, I'm going to keep my promise. And then the crematorium called me, and they said, you know, the press called us to ask if this, the head was on the body when it came, and I was like, oh, man, I did it. I didn't even think about that. He said, well, we want you to know we lied for you. Yeah. <laughs> and said, yep, because A, you're our client, and B, we think you're doing a wonderful thing. So, we lied for you. so I got away with it. No. Uh, so it's one of the things that's great about Chicago. It's a real Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could have had two heads if you wanted. But then, then after just a number of years ago, when somebody, some reporter brought some scientists there to look at them. Apparently, it was a skull that had a screw in there that was over 60 years old. So it, it came out that I committed 
broad, and I thought I was going to be skewered on the press. Uh, everyone was calling me, and I was hiding. I wouldn't talk to anybody because I didn't want anyone to think I was trying to put a host over on the roll. It was just I was just Dell's death that wish, and of course I was going to do it. But uh, then the New Yorker convinced me to let them tell my story. But I almost got in more trouble because when the New Yorker asked me, um, "Where did you get the skull?" I said. It's called the Anatomical Chart Society. He called and they said, oh no, we don't sell real skulls. I mean, we don't sell fake skulls, fake bones. So he called up and he goes, where'd you get the skull? So I was like, I swear to God, the Anatomical Chart Society, they kept denying it, so I thought, I'm going to go to jail. It's a good thing I murdered someone. Finally, we, we got uh, this, they said, is there, who worked there the longest? Was there anyone who worked there before all the people? And there was this woman who was retired, and we called her, and we said, did you ever sell skulls? And she was like, yes, we used to sell real skulls, but then we stopped. So I was like, thank God. I'm <laughs> sure I was going to prison. I'm keeping the story the way I heard it. I like it, well, I like it that way, too. You know, and Bob Falls, Bob Falls is, as far as I'm concerned, it's Dell Skull, and it was for many, many years. I did the best I could, you know. <laughs> he, always, he always said if he committed suicide, the way he was going to do it was with a weather balloon. He was going to tie a ripple weather balloon around his neck and then let it go and then just make it, it, it and, he'd, and he'd go up into the air and strangle to death and then he'd just be floating in the air so that the jets went by. <laughs> he could get a laugh. <laughs> he also liked that aspect because he would lose all control of his muscles and his bowels and he would be rocked in here and he would be all over the place. Yeah, so why would he shot, shot out of a cannon for it would be a birthday again and couldn't get it to happen? So, I mean, obviously he was, had this really serious drug addiction, and m most junkies are incredibly selfish, only thinking about themselves, only thinking about, you know, their, their drugs and how to get or whatever, and yet there's this generosity and this teaching uh, passion that he had and his passion to saying yes on stage. W what are your thoughts on how those, how, how those could coexist well, with him? wasn't a regular kind of junkie. Mm -hmm. I think he was a junkie so that he could give more. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And some junkies are like trying to escape from everything. And, I, and my feeling was he was trying to be able to get deeper in this stuff. And he wanted his mind to work faster so he could figure out faster things. So he was into speed. And then after a while, that would drive me crazy. And he'd have to go into, into uh, well, heroin. He, he always told me he was a better person than drugs. Mm -hmm. And that different drugs made him a different person. Mm -hmm. you know, so he was Cocaine, he was in heroin, he was in speed, mm -hmm. mean and alcohol. Um, he was also, he still, I think to some extent, self medicated himself too, because when he was a young man, his father committed suicide, and this was like the defining event, you know, for Dell. He was, I want to say, 18 or 20 when it happened, but uh, he would always refer to that. He had, very conflicted feelings about his father. But just keep in mind, Dell Close was, I can't overstate, he was the most complicated person. You know, so Dell could be on drugs. Alcohol was the worst drug for Dell. He could function very well on drugs. And yes, typically junkies are very self involved. That wasn't Dell. Dell loved this work and people who did it well and would not tolerate people who took advantage of the work for their own, you know, ego mm -hmm. satisfaction. But he could he could be high and direct. Um, he mostly was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and and was. In those days also, it wasn't a, a self-indulgent drug culture anywhere near as much as it was experimentation. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It was just, you know, well, they mind expanding the mind. Like that. Well, as yeah. I understand it, Dell didn't have much of a childhood. And I think he found drugs and improvisation at roughly the same time, and they both helped him uh, build his life. Because I think his father committed suicide. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think Dell found him, but I'm not sure. Well, that was the story Dell would tell. That was that was a very, very strange thing about Dell. I mean, he, this was such a defining event of his life, but he told at least three different versions of his father's <laughs> suicide. And the fact is, he was in New York when it happened, and he went back to Kansas after his father, and I think just in time for his father to finally pass away. 
Uh, but he told several different, different versions of the story, including, yes, he found his father's body, which he and he told the version that his father drank it from him. And he right. was That's what I heard. That's and I, I didn't heard. know there were other versions of what right. Dell yeah. told me until I read Howard Johnson's book. <laughs> yes. yeah, so, but, but a good question. Good question. Do we have any more? One in the back. Um, if, oh, sorry. If, you, uh, what do you, if, you, if Del Close ended up staying in San Francisco, how do you think it would probably be different here today? Wow. Well, if Dell hadn't found the Sharna here, uh, you know, I don't know if he would have had the strength to just to you know clean himself up and do what needed to be done. Um, you know, Dell was Dell would you know hang around bars, theaters, probably, and just you know find out where the improv scene was, and offer to get workshops. Yeah. That's what I think. Well, I, think I, think, oh. I think the Herald was developed really to a, a, a piece of art. LA and in Chicago when he was there. Because in San Francisco, it was kind of hard to watch. The actors didn't understand it. It was changing every night. The rules changed. Nobody knew what was put if they were making music or if they were supposed to improvise and stuff like that. So it's become a, it be, had become a kind of convoluted form. But then when they got down there, it, it, it uh, as they say, it coalesced. It, it, yes. Yeah, and to be honest, I mean, you could ask how modern comedy would have been different if Dell would have stayed here. He wouldn't have gone to Second City for this in the seventies in Chicago. He wouldn't have directed John Belushi. He wouldn't have directed Bill Murray and Aykroyd and Candy and Gilded and all of those people. That wouldn't have happened. So the, some of them would have made it. Yeah. So that's a very interesting question. But another interesting question, which I think is tied in with that one, is what if the committee had been more like Second City, and the committee would have continued its presence in San Francisco? It would be, you know, those are parallel universe questions. But the tradition of, of the committee and Dell's participation is like, I mean, you guys have a great history. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think that's it. Let's uh, let's next time our. Uh, <laughs>